to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's, you may have bradykinesia plus one of the following, either tremor, stiffness, or changes in walking and balance. So slowness plus any of those three is enough, is enough to make a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's. So you can see it's not a lot of requirements to make a diagnosis, and this also contributes to why sometimes we get them wrong. You know, you could make these diagnoses clinically, and they could fit a patient. A patient could have slowness and stiffness, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have Parkinson's, right? So it's an overly sensitive way of diagnosing these syndromes. However, it is the standard of care, and it has been for the last 50 years. Now, that's changing with the uh, advent of new technologies that will allow us to more readily identify patients who have Parkinson's. This is Shweta Mishra, your host, and today we are discussing advances in Parkinson's disease management. We have with us Dr. Andrus Deek from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Deek is Associate Professor of Clinical Neurology, Director of Experimental Therapeutics, and Associate Director of Movement Disorders Fellowship Program at the University of Pennsylvania. Joining Dr. Deek on the patient panel are patient advocates Dr. Frank Church, who is a Professor of Pathology and Lab Medicine and was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the age of 60 and Beverly Ribado, a traveler and author who cheers people up with her funny stories on Parkinson's and was diagnosed at the age of 47. Welcome to Cure Talks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Deek, to set a bit of a background for today's discussion, uh, could you please uh, begin by telling us what is Parkinson's disease and what are the underlying causes and mechanisms that drive the disease process in Parkinson's? Sure. So, well, Thank you again for the invitation. Um, Parkinson's disease is one of the most common neurodegenerative conditions in the United States and in the world. And it's characterized by the onset of motor symptoms, including slowness, stiffness, tremor, and balance problems, which are progressive over time and can lead to disability. Um, there are also a large number of non-motor symptoms that come with the disease that have been recently recognized. Um, and that can be as or even more disabling than the motor symptoms. Um, the disease itself has no cure at this point, but we do have a host of uh, symptomatic drugs that we use to manage this condition. The causes of PD are a little bit obscure. It is not fully understood why every patient gets this condition. However, for a subset of people, around 10 to 15%, it is due to genetic mutations that run in their families. Um, so there is a now more recognized burden of genetic mutations that can lead to disease. For folks who don't really have a family history, it is also thought that there are exposures in the environment that could lead to the disease. Uh, the ones that are most um, accepted upon are exposures to pesticides. So uh, patients who work as farmers spreading crops, um, uh, that has been recognized as a very strong predictor of disease. Um, some other exposures like heavy metal fumes, so patients who are welders um, or exposure to heavy metals in well water have also been recognized as a cause of the disease. However, for the majority of the patients that we see in our clinic, uh, and this is of course a very common question that they ask, we don't really have an answer as of why uh, this actually happened to them. Mm -hmm. And could you please uh, throw some light on the mechanisms, right? The underlying mechanisms uh, that drive this process. Yes, so Parkinson's disease is thought to be due to the accumulation of a protein called alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein is a protein uh, that we all have in our brains and it is actually involved in a number of different tasks in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, it is thought to be involved in um, neurochemical signaling between neurons as well as in the metabolism and energy uh, creation of the brain. Um, but in patients with Parkinson's, there has been noticed to be an accumulation of this protein, an abnormal accumulation, leading to these clumps, if you may, of protein that end up, uh, quote unquote, clogging up the mechanisms that happen within the cell, what we call the metabolic, like the metabolic chain of the cell. And this leads to degeneration and cell loss. And it is the cell loss of a specific type of cell, which is the 
um, dopamine cell, which lives in an area of the brain called the substantia nigra, that leads to most of the motor symptoms in Parkinson's. Um, however, the substantia nigra cells are not the only cells that are susceptible to accumulation of this protein. It has also been seen to be spread throughout the brain um, and in other types of neurons, including neurons that use a chemical called serotonin, another type of uh, neurons that use a chemical called acetylcholine to communicate among themselves. So it's really a widespread multicellular type of process, mm -hmm. uh, but the hallmark, the motor symptoms are thought to be mostly related to the drop in the chemical called dopamine due to generation of the cells that produce this chemical. Right, thank you. Um, uh, so you mentioned that the pathology um, involves misfolded alpha synuclein proteins and which are toxic to the neurons and leads to uh, loss of dopamine producing nerve cells. So what are the treatments? What are the treatments currently available to manage Parkinson's disease and its symptoms? Right. So as I mentioned before, we do not have a cure. So at this point, our technology has not advanced to the point that we're able to replace the cells that are lost. However, we are able to replete the dopamine levels that are uh, running low in patients with Parkinson's. We have synthetic medications, some of which um, resemble the effect of dopamine in the brain, others that slow down the breakdown of dopamine. And we have, of course, levodopa, which is the gold standard of treatment of Parkinson's disease, which once it crosses the blood-brain barrier and enters the brain, actually turns into dopamine. So the the mainstay of treatment, I would say, from a pharmacologic perspective, is really the repletion of this chemical that is running low. There are also other treatments that are non-pharmacological, and those are more interventions. Uh, FDA-approved interventions that exist in the U.S. and across the, war, uh, across the world at this point include deep brain stimulation surgery, in which uh, an electrode is inserted in the brain and stimulates the area of the brain where we think the motor symptoms are coming from. And there is a more recent procedure called focused ultrasound or high frequency, high intensity focused ultrasound um, that can be very helpful in the treatment of tremor in patients with Parkinson's disease. So there's a host of symptomatic therapies that we have. Exercise, I will say, may be the one and only intervention at this point that might slow down the disease and should also be considered as a very important complement to whatever other uh, therapy that the patient is receiving. Right, right, thank you. Um, um, could you also share some uh, research advances happening in the field of Parkinson's disease? Talk about some of the clinical trials that are going on at Penn that our audience can keep track of and touch upon some of the promising drugs and therapies in the pipeline? Sure, so we have a robust portfolio of clinical trials here at Penn. Um, we have clinical trials both for compounds that might slow down the course of the disease, as well as compounds that are um, not disease modifying, but can actually be effective in the management of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. If we think of the clinical trials that we have available here at Penn, I would say we have uh, three main categories in which we subdivide them. Mm -hmm. One group of studies are for patients who are diagnosed within three years who have never taken medication for Parkinson's. The second category would be for patients who have been diagnosed in the last three years but are already taking medications for Parkinson's. And then the third category would be for patients who have been diagnosed more than three years, most of whom, or all of whom I would say, are likely to be taking some sort of medication. Uh, within the group of patients diagnosed for less than three years, um, that's where we have uh, the bulk of our disease-modifying trials, so the compounds that might slow down the disease. We have uh, studies that are looking at intervention, exercise interventions for disease modification. We also have infusion trials for compounds that might uh, hopefully uh, target the root cause of Parkinson's and uh, allow the brain to get rid of those proteins that are accumulated. In terms of drugs that are used for symptomatic therapy, we have drugs for the treatment or that might be helpful for the treatment of dyskinesias, which are these involuntary movements that sometimes happen uh, further in the course of the disease. We also have medications that might um, prevent the onset of or, or delay the onset of um, changes in cognitive function and falls.
So as you can see, we have a um, really a potpourri, if you may, of clinical trials um, that can really fit um, many of our different patient characteristics. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for that detail, um, Dr. Deek. Uh, so you mentioned uh, dopamine replacement therapy is the mainstay treatment for Parkinson's disease right now. Uh, but we know that it has several side effects and also does not delay the progression of the disease and slows. it doesn't slow neurodegeneration. So um, could you please shed some light about the status of gene therapy in the management of Parkinson's disease? Yes. So gene therapy is a... Uh, promising and exciting new field in the management of PD. Um, there are a number of different clinical trials around the country looking at different uh, ways of fixing the genes that we think increase the risk of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. One of those studies we do have here at Penn uh, where we are looking at a specific type of patient with Parkinson's who is, uh, they have the condition secondary to a mutation in a gene um, that is uh, one of the most common causes of genetic forms of Parkinson's. Um, and basically the study is looking at ways of delivering that gene, the normal version of the gene, back to the patients in the hope that correcting the gene mutation will ultimately translate into a reduction in the progression of, of symptoms and, and the disease itself. Um, these uh, types of um, Clinical trials are early in their development. We're talking about mostly phase one studies. Um, so we will have to see whether these uh, studies actually are successful, but we're certainly very excited about it. And I think as we recognize more and more genetic causes for Parkinson's, we'll probably have a larger option or, or larger um, amount of options of gene therapies for these trials. There's also a prospect that some of these gene therapies may actually also work for patients who don't necessarily have a gene mutation. So that I think is also very exciting because we're talking about being able to provide this cutting edge technology to the broader Parkinson's population. Right, that's very interesting, uh, Dr. Deek. Um, at this point now, I would like to invite the patient panel, Dr. Deek, to the dis uh, discussion. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Frank C. Church, professor of pathology and lab medicine, who was diagnosed uh, uh, at the age of 60. And as a longtime educator and scientist, he's committed to helping others learn more about Parkinson's. Dr. Church, you have the floor. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Deek. I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I get my first question would be, you talked about the, the role and the importance of aerobic exercise as being neuroprotective. And what strategy can you do to convince your patients to actually exercise? If most of the people that I know with Parkinson's are, are my age or older, and they don't like to exercise. How do you, how do you convince them how important it is? That's a, that's a great question. It's a challenge, I will say. Um, some patients who come to see us already have the habit of exercising, so that's easy, right? So to just tell them, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but how do we convert, if you may, the non-exerciser to an exerciser? There's a few strategies, I will say. Um, I, I usually think about it depending on whether patients still working or not. Mm -hmm. So for patients who are still working, I usually tell them to try to fit it in the morning before they go to work. Just try to uh, carve out 20, 25, 30 minutes every morning, even if it means waking up a little bit, or, bit of earlier but just kind of getting it out of the way and then just you know, going on with your daytime routine. Now, patients who are retired or no longer working do have some more flexibility with time. So the benefit there is that you don't have to tell them to wake up earlier, which many people don't like to do. Uh, but I usually still tell them to try to fit it in the morning. I feel like most patients after they exercise um, develop a feeling of well-being and sort of an energizing sort of effect that carries out throughout the day. Um, so, so I, I, I tell them that, you know, it's, it's like taking an extra pill, like it, it, the same sort of motor benefit that a pill could provide, a little bit of exercise could provide to you, and you want to capitalize on that and make sure that you front load that in the day. Something I do see is that there are patients who like to exercise at night, and they tell me that after they exercise, they do have this rush of energy, but then they have trouble going to sleep because they're sort of still <laughs> revved up from having an exercise later in the day. So, so as I was saying, I, I usually encourage it earlier in the day rather than later. Um, if there are patients who like it at night and they find that it doesn't interfere with sleep, then, you know, again, whatever works for you works for you. 
Um, but I have seen that sort of trying to put it in earlier in the day tends to work for most patients. Okay, good. That, that was helpful. Okay, my next question may not have an answer. Are you concerned at all about COVID-19 promoting or accelerating Parkinson's? That's a great question, and I think the jury's still out. Um, there was a review, I want to say it was published last year, uh, by a Brazilian group looking at movement disorders happening after COVID-19. And contrary to the thought that Parkinsonism was a big one, it was actually a minority of patients that were seen to be Parkinsonian, the most likely um, movement disorder seen in patients after COVID-19 was actually myoclonus, which is another movement disorder, completely different from Parkinson's. But I do worry that we might be headed towards a situation similar to the 1920s pandemic, where there was this delayed effect from mm -hmm. the Spanish flu uh, with patients developing what's now known as encephalitis lethargica or uh, post-encephalitic Parkinsonism. Again, we haven't seen those cases yet, but more and more we have evidence that even mild cases of COVID-19 can have an impact in brain function to some extent that we don't quite understand yet. So I think the community in general is very much on the lookout to see whether there will be an uptick of cases in the next few years. Um, and, and, and I guess the jury, as I said, the jury is still out, but, but yes, it is a source of concern. And I'm hoping that the virus is this similar enough to the virus from a century ago that we will not be headed in that direction. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I hope so too. Um, okay, my next question, and I've talked to a lot of people that have Parkinson's and their neurologists sometimes really don't want them taking supplements. Um, I take, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I read a lot, I think a lot, and I take a lot of supplements from, from the literature. And, and my neurologist has been very supportive of me and, and my, my trek to try and maintain my health and my remaining dopamine neurons from dying further. And I'm just wondering what your, what your belief is about using supplements. Well, some of supplements we know that are ineffective. For example, coenzyme Q10 has been mm -hmm. studied thoroughly. There was a large study, was it called the QE3 study, uh, which was done a few years ago, and high doses of coenzyme Q10 were studied and shown not to be effective. Uh, so there are some supplements that we know do not help. However, for the great majority of them, we do not have that evidence suggesting that they do not work. And the truth is that they are helpful uh, for health in general. So yeah. my approach is usually that as long as the supplement is not harmful, uh, mm -hmm. I am not opposed at all to patients taking supplements. I do caution my patients that supplements can be expensive. Uh, so the cost of them tends to add up. Uh, and then yeah. some of our patients who unfortunately um, have strict finances might not have the luxury of trying a wide variety of supplements just because it's just not financially feasible for them. But if it doesn't burn a hole in your pocket and it's not causing any harm, I think, again, there's a lot that we don't know about the benefit of these supplements. So I'm not at all opposed to our patients using them. Okay, good. That, that actually helps me. Um, my final question relates to DBS surgery. And my neurologist of all has always told me that he thinks I'd be a good candidate for it at, at some future time. And, but I keep running into friends and people that have had the surgery that are having a really difficult time recovering from it. And I'm just wondering, if, are there algorithms or are there good ways to predict who should be a good candidate for DBS surgery? And, and you know, what are the, what are the pitfalls? How, how do you predict somebody should have a good response? I, it, it just kind of concerns me now all of a sudden. Yeah, no, that, that's a fantastic question, actually. I think patient selection is key. Um, and patient selection goes both ways. Goes, number one, how does the patient look and what are the patient's characteristics? But number two, what are the patient's goals for the surgery? And I'll, I'll kind of go into both of those categories. So speaking about the patient's characteristics first, there's a few characteristics that we like to see in patients who we think are ideal candidates. Number one, patients who are cognitively intact. This is a brain surgery, 
um, and there is reported cognitive loss after the procedure. It's usually just a matter of a few IQ points, but for patients who, whose cognition is not the greatest, that could mean the difference between uh, somebody who's cognitively intact and somebody who has mild cognitive impairment, for example. Mm -hmm. So we usually send patients for a test called neuropsychological testing, where we really make sure that cognition is really in good shape. So that's number one. Okay. Number two, um, we look for patients who are levodopa responsive. Uh, so I think it's reassuring when we see that patients take levodopa and many of their symptoms improve. And the degree of improvement from doses of levodopa tends to be predictive of the success of the surgery. Um, now, the one exception to that is tremor. So tremor can, can be a symptom that can be really hard to treat with dopaminergic therapy, but it really responds in a remarkable way with surgery. So I would say the one exception to the, um, to the dopamine responsive rule is if somebody has a lot of tremor that is refractory to medication. But everything else, I would say we do like to see that dopamine responds. And what we do is we do something called on-off testing where patients come into the office off their medications, we examine them, then they, we provide them their medications and we examine them again and we track the amount of improvement pre and post. And that again is predictive of benefit. And then the third patient characteristic is that the patient is otherwise healthy for surgery. So kidneys, liver, lungs, heart, everything else should be in good shape. Um, we also like patients who are uh, younger than 80 if possible. Now that doesn't mean that we don't operate in people older than 80, we do, uh, but we, are a little bit more judicious on our, our patient selection once they're over the age of 80. So that's category number one. Category number two is what are the symptoms you want treated? So DBS is really great to treat some symptoms, but it's not really very good to treat some others. So the symptoms that respond the best with deep brain stimulation is, as I said, tremor, but also slowness and stiffness. DBS oftentimes has equivocal benefits in terms of gait. So walking is a little bit hard to predict. Some patients notice that they actually walk worse after surgery, and that's a real risk that we usually counsel our patients. And DBS can also deteriorate cognition, as I mentioned before, but it can also deteriorate speech. So if a patient is going to DBS so that they can speak better, we usually tell them, well, maybe DBS is not the best thing for you. So if you have a patient who you know, fulfills all the characteristics that I mentioned in the first category and who has a symptom that we know responds very well for surgery, those are the folks we highly encourage to have surgery. Now, the other benefit I will say is that DBS also allows patients to have more on time and less off time. Um, so um, it also helps with motor fluctuations when patients are noticing that the medication is lasting for three hours or less. And the other thing is that after DBS, it allows us to reduce the amount of medicine a patient takes, and that can also help with dyskinesias. So that can also be a symptom that patients are interested in treating. So if, if patients have one of these symptoms that we know respond, those are the patients who do the best. But I would say the patients who have less than ideal outcomes after surgery are usually those who either A, weren't good candidates from a physical point of view to begin with, or B, were most hopeful that would have a symptom that would improve that is not one of the ones that typically improves after DBS. That was, that was really helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. George, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Geek. Um, with that, I will now invite Beverly Ribotto. Uh, Beverly was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at the age of 47, and she continues to laugh about her life with Parkinson's and cheers others through her funny stories and song parodies. Beverly, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Deek. Good morning. Uh, I guess one, my first question is, why are neurologists reluctant to reduce either the dosages or discontinue medications? Um, in my own case, and like I said, I was diagnosed 15 years ago. Every time I went to see my doctor, it was always like, increase, increase, increase. And had I not figured out on my own that a recent increase was causing my severe cognitive issues, I probably would have been confined to a memory care facility years ago. 
but because I managed to figure it out on my own and insisted that we discontinue or lower that dosage, I'm back to, within just a matter of months, I was back to my old brainiac self. Well, first of all, congratulations on being back to your old brainiac self. Um, I think you raise a very good point. You know, as the disease progresses, oftentimes we as treating physicians consider that patients need more medication to make up for the symptoms that are now not as well controlled on medication as they were before. However, it is a fine balance. Unfortunately, with medications, as you go up on the doses, as much as you might have a motor benefit or a non-motor benefit sometimes, you also run into side effect profiles. So the side effects of the medications that we use tend to be side tend to be dose dependent, meaning the more you take of a drug, the more likely you are to experience a side effect. And it certainly is something that is always in the back of our mind whenever we do adjustments in medicines. There's different strategies for it. Um, so one, I would say, and, and this applies to me, but I would say it applies to my colleagues and for most people in the movement disorder field, we actually embrace polypharmacy, meaning taking multiple medications to treat symptoms. So if you think of high blood pressure, for example, oftentimes your doctor will give you a blood pressure pill and will really go up as high as they can on that blood pressure pill without, before adding a second one. Whereas in movement disorder, we don't quite follow that approach. We might give you a small dose of this and a small dose of that. And it is more pills, but the idea of doing that is that you can keep the dose low enough that you minimize the risk of side effects. And then by adding these different medications through different mechanisms of action, you can have a net motor benefit at the end. So, so I think you, you raise a very good point about the real risk of side effects that is involved in high doses of medicines. And it's something that we as treating physicians should always keep in the back of our minds. Thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Church might like to hear this. DBS has actually been life-changing for me. Um, I had bilateral STN. It'll be 10 years ago in October. Um, my settings are extremely low. And I have been off all Parkinson's meds for over two years. And yet I find that uh, it's not recommended very often, especially for people who are young onset. Um, any reason why it's not suggested? Yeah, more so, often? sure. I think as neurologists, we tend to be probably overly conservative. I think we now understand the risks and benefits of DBS. Um, and we probably, as movement specialists, um, do advocate for its use and, and try to find the right patients who would most benefit from this therapy. Um, but it is an invasive procedure. So I think being that we're not surgeons ourselves, but rather uh, um, just, you know, prescribing physicians, we do try to rely on medications um, for a while before uh, sort of suggesting the idea of an invasive procedure. But as you mentioned, I mean, for some people, it really can be life-changing. Uh, some people can really get a great benefit out of it. Um, and I think we, we tend to be conservative also because we want to make sure that we have the diagnosis right. So in the first five years after people start having their symptoms, um, there is always the possibility that patients don't actually have Parkinson's, but have one of the atypical Parkinsonian syndromes. Um, and at the beginning, it can just be very difficult to tell clinically whether, whether somebody has one or the other. Now, the reason why I mentioned this caveat is because patients with atypical Parkinsonian syndrome do not respond to DBS and actually can do worse after surgery. So I think many of us really want to make sure we have the diagnosis right before we offer this therapy. Um, but, but as you mentioned, I think for the right patient, it can really be a home run. Thank you. And uh, also to Dr. Church, I'd like to say to him, the neurosurgeon skill is, is uh, a good priority. But if you don't have an excellent programmer, then the surgery is pretty much worthless. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Um, um, are there any treatments for drooling? Um, I get a lot of uh, people with Parkinson's asking me about this, and of course I'm affected with it as well sometimes, which is one of the few upsides to wearing uh, these COVID masks. <laughs> Yes, a lot of my patients tell me that nowadays. So it hides their drooling and it hides when they have like a tongue tremor or a yaw or a jaw tremor. So yeah, yeah those are the, the small silver linings here. Um, yeah, there's actually a number of different treatments uh, for the treatment of, of drooling. Um, there are medications, oral medications that can help. Uh, we tend not to use them very much because they do tend, have to, tend to have systemic side effects. Uh, the one that we worry the most about is uh, confusion or hallucinations. At low doses, it's usually not a problem, but as you escalate, it becomes more of a concern. There are also um, topical treatments. Uh, these are off-label treatments where people use drops um, that go in the mouth under the tongue, and it can help dry the mouth up for about 12 to 24 hours. And then there are injections, botulinum toxin injections, um, have been shown to be effective in the treatment of drooling. Um, usually those injections go in the cheeks or under the jaw, and that can help with drooling for about three months at a time. So many of our patients use one of these treatments or a combination of them, and they can be very effective. Thank you. And then I guess my other question is um, basically most of my doctors and most of the other people here locally, their doctors are always recommending PT, OT, speech therapy, the big program, the loud program. Um, but there are, any, there are not any certified therapists in our area, even though you know, we have well over 150 to 300 people show up whenever we do big Parkinson seminars here. So, um, I, you know, in, in some ways, I wish um, our neurologists understood that we lack access to treatments because of where we live and or finances. Okay. My own movement disorder specialist is 250 miles away, and I haven't seen her since 2019 due to COVID. So a lot of us, we, you know, we must take care of ourselves. Yeah, that's a, you, you, you raise a very good point, and I think it just shows how specialized care for Parkinson's is really confined to large metropolitan areas and how there are all these pockets uh, within the country where it's really difficult to access care. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very big problem in this country and really across the world. Um, Speaking of silver linings of the pandemic, I think the other silver lining is the access to telemedicine. So before COVID-19, telemedicine was seen as this luxury that was inaccessible, but now uh, it's really open to everybody. I mean, today we're doing this interview and none of us are in the same room, right? So I think this digital revolution is really something that is gonna change the face of healthcare for the better. Um, and I think that also includes access to exercise programs online or, you know, Zumba classes, yoga classes, things that patients can now access from the comfort of their home without having to expose themselves um, to, you know, catching a contagious disease or traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, I'm hoping that all of you know, something that will come from the pandemic is a little bit more equity in the way that care is delivered across the country. And, and I'm hoping, too, that there will be laws that will follow that will allow this to be uh, a permanent change as opposed to this emergency authorization in the face of the pandemic. Um, yeah, that would be nice because um, with my uh, Medi Medicare Advantage plan, televisits are covered for mental health and for primary care, but not specialists. Yes, so uh, I think- so uh, Once again, to, uh, location is, is a problem for where I live. We do, we do not even have a board certified neurologist in our town. We have 
two psychiatrists who pretend to be a neurologist and none, no one with Parkinson's will go see them. Yeah, I think we, we need to do some door knocking to our uh, local state senates and really advocate for ourselves and, and for the community and, and to raise this awareness. Uh, and it's just, it's not just Parkinson's, you know, it's all, it's all the neurodegenerative conditions and really other conditions too. Um, yeah. Knowing that we have these resources, we, it, it just seems silly to me that we would go back to a world where, where we would cut access the way we have it now. Thank you. Thank you, Bev. Um, Dr. Deek, I have just a few more questions before we wrap up for today. Um, and I want to circle back and talk a little bit about the diagnosis and early signs of Parkinson's disease. Um, I know you mentioned uh, gait, right? Um, experts diagnose it by gait of the uh, patients, right? They just ask them to walk and they're able to diagnose if they have Parkinson's. Um, could you please talk a little bit more about other symptoms or other parameters that are used to diagnose Parkinson's disease? And are there any blood tests or scans that help in definitive diagnosis? Yeah, so the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease remains a clinical diagnosis. To make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, you, might have, you must have one symptom that is a cardinal sign of Parkinson's, which is slowness or bradykinesia. And to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's, you might have bradykinesia plus one of the following, either tremor, stiffness, or changes in walking and balance. So slowness plus any of those three is enough, is enough to make a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's. So you can see it's not a lot of requirements to make a diagnosis, and this also contributes to why sometimes we get them wrong. You know, you could make these diagnoses clinically, and they could fit a patient. A patient could have slowness and stiffness, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have Parkinson's, right? So it's an overly sensitive way of diagnosing these yeah. syndromes. However, it is the standard of care and it has been for the last 50 years. Now that's changing with the uh, advent of new technologies that will allow us to more readily identify patients who have Parkinson's. There is a scan that has been available in the US since around 2011 called a DAT scan. That scan is a, stands for a dopamine transporter scan and it allows to visualize the integrity of the dopamine circuits in the brain. Um, so it can be very black and white to distinguish between patients who have some form of Parkinson's versus no form of Parkinson's. Uh, and we do use a DAT scan sometimes in patients. Usually the indication is for patients who have a tremor, but not much else. And you're not sure if it's a tremor from Parkinson's or is a tremor from another tremor condition. So that I would say is the main reason why we do that scan. There are more recent technologies that now allow to analyze uh, samples um, to look for uh, the presence of alpha synuclein. Um, these are more recent technologies available in the last year or two. Looking at the presence of alpha synuclein in cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that bathes the cell and the, uh, the brain and the spinal cord, uh, as well as in uh, skin biopsies. So people are getting little samples of the skin looking under the microscope and finding some alpha synuclein there. So I think, especially for clinical trials, as we develop these technologies, my guess is that many of the trials are gonna request some sort of confirmation, uh, especially for those trials that are recruiting patients very early in the course of the disease, just to make sure that we're able to have a unified homogeneous population within the studies. Oh, oh, that's very interesting to follow. Um, uh, uh, let's talk about the progression of uh, Parkinson's a bit, Dr. Deek. Uh, so across what stages uh, could this disease progress and what are the symptoms that differentiate the various stages of Parkinson's? Right, so the staging is also clinical and we, both, we go by really the symptoms that the patients have. So stage one is when patients have symptoms only on one side of the body. So Parkinson's disease is a condition that usually starts on one side and then spreads to the other. The side where it starts is usually the side that the symptoms are always the worst on. Um, when the symptoms go to the opposite side, we talk about stage two. We think of stage three when the balance is affected. We think of stage four when patients require uh, some sort of device to ambulate, like a walker, for, for example. And then we think of stage five when patients are wheelchair or bed bound. Uh, so the progression and their ability to ambulate really determines the clinical staging of the disease. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so, Dr. Deek, uh, uh, let's talk about the risk factors a little bit. And one of the biggest risk factors is Parkin of this disease is age, right? Uh, we see it as a geriatric disease. 
Uh, but we do also see the disease in younger population as young as 20 to 30 year olds, right? We know uh, Michael J. Fox was diagnosed at 30. Uh, so I'm just curious, what could be triggering the occurrence of Parkinson's at such a young age? Yeah, so we now recognize that there is this entity called young onset Parkinson's disease where patients have really early symptoms of Parkinson's. And largely, patients with young onset Parkinson's disease are thought to be due to genetic causes. So now with the um, sort of refinement of gene sequencing technology, we're able to really scan the patient's genomes and really find mutations that we did not really know before um, that existed. Uh, so patients with young onset Parkinson's disease have always existed. Uh, we now just do a better job in knowing exactly what gene is causing them. Okay, interesting. Um, so Dr. Deek, uh, I have one last question before we wrap up for today, and that's about neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Uh, one in five people with Parkinson's have this condition. So could you please talk about what it is and why does that happen to Parkinson's patients and how is it managed? Yeah, so uh, orthostatic hypotension is relatively common in patients with Parkinson's. Uh, we think that as the autonomic nervous system, which is the part of the nervous system that is in, in charge of sort of automatic bodily functions, including the regulation of blood pressure, um, we think that the autonomic nervous system is affected in patients with Parkinson's. Not only with Parkinson's, other forms of other Parkinson's syndromes also feature this. But since we're talking about Parkinson's today, that's one of the conditions that also feature this. And it's manifested by a drop in blood pressure that is, no, that is noticed when the patient stands up. So the patient stands, feels lightheaded, uh, oftentimes, although not always, and that translates into a drop of around 20 points in their systolic blood pressure. The causes are multifactorial. Uh, one, as I said, the involvement of the autonomic nervous system, but two, the medications that we use also sometimes can trigger uh, orthostatic hypotension. So um, going back, um, to the question before about medication side effects, that's one of the ones that we are very, very much in the lookout for. And we routinely check blood pressure sitting and standing in our patients to see whether that's something that's coming up. Um, it could also be other medications that the patients are taking that are not necessarily for the treatment of Parkinson's that are also lowering the blood pressure. So that can also happen. And then a very big one is dehydration. So patients with Parkinson's uh, are more prone to dehydration. And in the hot summer months, that's certainly true. Um, you know, the, I would say June, July, August, and September are the toughest months for my patients. And what I try to do is, as, um, as the summer approaches, so around now, actually, I start really advocating for aggressive hydration in my patients, as long as they don't have any reasons not to keep themselves well hydrated, like kidney problems or heart problems or lung problems or things like that. Um, but I think keeping yourself very well hydrated, if you can, avoiding medications that can further... Uh, lower blood pressure and being mindful that you have this condition uh, can certainly prevent the biggest thing that we dread with orthostatic hypotension, which is uh, falls and the complications that come with that. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for that information, doctor. Uh, with that, uh, it's time to wrap up for today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deek, for educating us on Parkinson's disease today. Um, Dr. Church and Bev, thanks for joining and guiding the panel with your very insightful questions. Uh, we also thank the University of Pennsylvania and the stock will be available on QTalks.com. So until next time we meet, thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.